Hey everyone, if you guys don't know me, my name is Rachel and today's video is going to be a really big important one. It's probably going to be quite long. Um, I've spent a lot of time kind of thinking about what I want to say in this, doing quite a bit of research. We're going to be talking about the issue of consent, which is something I think is really, really important. Something that I'm very, very keen and passionate to talk about. Um, and I'm going to actually be bringing in, <laughs> this might sound crazy, some British soaps like as in the TV soaps, as an example and kind of like as a talking point and to show how they can do some real good in the world to like bring certain important issues to the forefront of people's mind and get them talking about it, basically. But ultimately we're going to be talking about consent today. I am going to be using a lot of clips from TV shows, so I'm pretty sure I'm going to get at least a couple of million copyright strikes. I'm probably not going to make any money from this, but I'm I'm okay with that because it's something I really want to talk about. Like I say, this could be quite long, but I think it's going to be important. I think it's going to be a good one, so just bear with me and let's get through this together. Soaps in general don't really have a good reputation, or at least not a good reputation in terms of being like quality TV, you know? I don't know what they're like in other countries, so I'm not going to talk about them. I don't know what they're like in America or wherever. Um, all I can really talk about are British soaps, and I know there's going to be some big kind of like differences between what they're like in different countries. But like I say, I'll just talk about the UK ones. They're often quite cheesy, they're often very overdramatic, they're not necessarily like high budget or artsy, um, and they focus more on getting like a quantity of episodes out instead of being like works of art, you know what I mean? I think like you look at EastEnders and they get out four 30 minute episodes a week, which is a lot of TV. They're light and they're fun and they are predominantly there to like entertain you and you know, let you get lost in a story for 30 minutes a night. That's the main kind of reason behind soaps, at least the main reason behind them today. I know they have like a whole history of like being adverts and so on, but, but today soaps are there to entertain. But you know, sometimes they do touch on some really tough storylines and topics and sometimes they screw it up a little bit, but other times I think they do a hell of a lot of good when approaching certain difficult topics. And I think seeing soaps tackle these big, often controversial issues is actually like a really big part of UK culture. It's something where like every workplace I've worked in, you know, you'll have a big storyline going on a soap and then everyone will get together like the next day and like chat about it in the office or in the shop or whatever where you're working. Like it's, it's definitely an English thing. I did some research and apparently in the UK, um, viewing figures for soaps have been dropping, but on general now they get around like six to seven million viewers per episode, which is a hell of a lot. That's like 10% of the population. You know, and those numbers don't include the people who watch the omnibus episodes on a weekend, or the people who watch on like iPlayer or Catch Up, or the people who illegally download. You know, so there's a hell of a lot of people watching these soaps, even if a lot of people won't admit to it because they're a bit of a guilty pleasure. That's me. <laughs> I used to watch soaps all the time growing up, and then when I moved away to uni I kind of like fell out of touch with them. And then uh, while I was working in this marketing role, I saw a, a comment, like, uh, sorry, I saw a discussion break out in the comment section on one of our threads about the whole who killed Lucy Beale thing on EastEnders, and I was like, okay, I could turn this into a thing where we sell like crime fiction books by like doing a list of whodunits. I should probably catch up with EastEnders just so I know kind of what they're talking about and so I can kind of link it in and make it relevant. And like I say, I watched one episode of EastEnders and then I've been hooked for the last four years ever since, uh, or three years, however long it's been. And um, I watch it all the time now. It is, it is my guilty pleasure. Dan does judge me and mock me every time I watch it. And every time he walks into the room, he's like, who is that? Why is she wearing so much fake tan? What are they doing? Weren't they just together a week ago? Why have they broken up? How many kids do they have? He just, he constantly mocks it and um, I hate him for it, but I know he's completely right. <laughs> anyway, back to my original point. It's literally like around 10% of the UK population that watch soaps every weekday night, which makes them the perfect place to bring up these really important and difficult and like I say, often controversial topics. It like brings them to the forefront of people's minds and brings them to kind of like a public forum where people can discuss these really difficult things, and I think that's a really, really important thing for TV to do. In re recent years, you look at soaps like Coronation Street that have tackled some really tough topics uh, like child sex abuse and grooming. Um, EastEnders has also covered this over the years with Whitney's storyline, where um, it was like her stepmother's boyfriend who was grooming her from like 12 years old. 
that was a really difficult one to watch but it was really really important. Soaps also regularly cover issues like uh, fertility issues, miscarriages, losing a child, um, EastEnders recently had a really emotional story revolving around life knife crime in London which really really hit me hard because I live in London and literally in the weeks that storyline was going on I was in the park with Kyra and had to call the police to a knife fight that was literally happening in front of us which was terrifying. So like I say these soaps seem light and fluffy on the surface but they can cover some really important and relevant issues and I actually think if you want to kind of find out a little bit more about like a culture at the time often it's a good idea to look back at soaps and see like you know what were the issues within the family back in the 80s like you look at Coronation Street something like that you know um anyway rambling like I say I think soaps cover these topics so well because with there being these serial dramas you get really invested in the characters and you understand the characters and you relate to them and you do get very emotionally invested in them so when something crappy happens to them it hits you hard you know and it's easier to understand and follow and empathize with these characters that you know and the issues that they're going through you know you might have never experienced a miscarriage yourself but if a character you've been watching every other weeknight for five years experiences a miscarriage, you start to understand a little bit more about what they're feeling by like viewing them and understanding their emotions. Does that make sense? Like the EastEnders knife crime story, it took the very important issue of knife crime and moved it away from just statistics and ooh it's bad kids and that won't happen to my kid and ooh it won't affect me. It moved it away from all of that and brought it into a place where we saw it affect a family just like our families, you know. It took a good kid from a good family who we'd watched grow up on screen and who we loved and we saw him be the innocent victim of a horrific crime. We saw essentially a child that we loved be killed for no good reason. It stops it being just about knives and gangs and thugs and statistics and brings it into your home, your life, it helps you understand it, see how these things affect real people and start to discuss, discuss what the actual issues are and what the real solutions could be. It starts a conversation and that is so, so important. Often when certain storylines are uh, covered on a soap. Afterwards in the credits they'll provide things like uh, phone numbers or websites or email addresses for like crisis lines or charities or like, I don't know, like contact information. Um, and a lot of charities and help centres often report an increased number in like reported cases or people asking for help after a soap has covered a storyline because it brings awareness to it. It helps people know where and how and why they can get help and so on. And I think that's a really, really good thing and we shouldn't just kind of look down on it just because it's a soap doing it. One of the really, really big issues that um, I guess you could say kind of gets like cycled through soaps fairly regularly is the topic of rape. Rape is a big, sensitive, but very important topic. Um, and like I say, soaps tend to cover it with some frequency. You'll be hard pressed to find a soap that hasn't covered a rape in the last like year or so. Back in the 80s, um, EastEnders tackled rape with Kathy Beale being raped by her boss in the bar where she worked and that storyline was returned to just last year with Kathy um, sort of confronting her rapist like 30 years on to show that you know even though these things happen in the past the trauma that they cause can last for years and still have an impact on people's lives. It's not just a throwaway thing which I thought was a really really great little thing to include. Similarly, they covered rape, but from a slightly different angle, when Linda, who um, owns the main pub in EastEnders, was raped by her husband's brother, which shows how like these things can happen, um, even from people you know and trust and let into your home and who are part of your family. EastEnders also tackled rape back in the early 2000s, I want to say maybe 2001-ish, um, when they showed Little Mo Slater being raped by her husband, to show that rape isn't just something that happens uh, from, you know, people outside the relationship. You can be raped in a marriage as well. Um, it was an absolutely heartbreaking little domestic violence story and it's one of the ones that um, I was probably too young to watch but I still watched and it still sticks with me to this day. It, it did really have a big impact on me. Uh, and I, I mean that in a good way, I don't mean like it traumatised me. But I think, um, some people say like kids shouldn't watch this sort of stuff or it's not appropriate for soaps or whatever, but I think um, it is really important to include it and it's really important for children to kind of see that these things can happen and learn from it because it showed me that even when you're married 
your body is still yours. Just because you marry someone, just because you're in a relationship with someone, it doesn't mean you give up everything for them. You, you, you still keep your autonomy and your independence. And if anyone ever tries to take that from you, you fight back. That's what that storyline taught me when I was like, I don't know, seven years old or something. Um, and it's, it's a lesson that's stuck with me ever since. There's also been uh, plenty of cases of like stranger rape. So I think the one that sticks with me was again, sort of early 2000s. Toya on Coronation Street came back from a night out. Uh, she was walking down a dark alley to get home and she was raped and beaten and left by a stranger, which was one of those like, again, terrifying little stories that taught me to always be careful and never walk alone after a light night out, you know? And speaking of Coronation Street, they have recently done what I think is a very important storyline. Before, rape stories have always been kind of shown to be about women being the victims, women being made to feel weak by men, women being overpowered by people they thought they knew or strangers or whatever. Recently, Coronation Street have been doing a storyline uh, featuring David Platt where he was raped by another man to show that men can be the victims and that there's no shame in admitting that, you know, that happened to you as a man, but also in sh showing that, you know, this can happen to men, we need to talk about this happening to men, and this is how men can get help in those situations, uh, which I think is a really, really important thing to do. The storyline I am kind of following closest at the minute, and the one I really want to talk about today, and the one that I think uh, is very important and that is being done very well, is Ruby Allen's rape storyline on EastEnders. So last, not last week, the week before now, um, they released a special 30 minute episode set entirely in the local pub, which featured Ruby confronting her rapists, yes, rapists plural, um, and some pretty heated discussions between the kind of main characters on the soap around the topic of consent and rape and what counts and what doesn't count. And, you know, some men do this, some men do this. I thought it was a fantastic episode. It was very well made. It showed that the lines aren't always as clear cut as some people think they are. It showed that there are gray areas. It showed that there are questions to be asked, discussions to be had. It showed that opinions are changing. It showed that rapists aren't always evil people just out there looking to hurt women. It showed that more often than not, they're just normal men who might not realize what they're doing is wrong or might not want to admit that what they're doing is wrong. Um, whether it's like naivety or ignorance or whatever, like it doesn't excuse what they did at all, but it definitely brings a different side to the story, to the conversation, whatever. So Ruby Allen is portrayed by actress Louisa Lytton and she first appeared in EastEnders back in, I think it was like 2005. Uh, she wasn't actually on it for that long, but she was a real fan favorite. Like everyone loved Ruby Allen. I loved Ruby. She was a great character. 12 years after she's left, she returned to the soap, like in, in her role as Ruby. And this is her first big storyline since she's come back. So to give you a little overview of what happened, Ruby goes on a night out to a local bar with her friend Stacy and her husband Martin and his friends. Like any typical 20, 30 something woman, uh, she, she goes out, she wears a pretty dress, it's a little bit short, she drinks a lot, she has a little flirt, she kisses a guy in a club, and then she goes back to their place for more drinks. While she's there, she is very, very drunk. She's confused. She wanders into the wrong room where one of the guys, Ross, comes in, starts kissing her. They have sex. She passes out and wakes up some time later, she doesn't really know when, with a man on top of her. At first she thinks it's Ross, but then realizes that it's not him at all. It's his friend, Matt. She's drunk. She doesn't remember most of what's happened. She doesn't really remember how she got there all that much. Um, she doesn't know how or why or when Matt came into the room and got on top of her. Um, she's scared, she's confused, and she just lays there. She doesn't know how to say no, she doesn't know if she can, so she just lays there. The first guy, Ross, um, it should also be noted, was basically outside the room at this time, like encouraging his friend Matt to go, you know, sleep with this unconscious woman. So the next day, the two guys are bragging about what happened, especially to Martin, who's kind of like a little bit confused. They're calling her easy, they're calling her a slag, yada yada. Um, but they don't think that they raped her because even though she was unconscious for a lot of it, even though she was too drunk to consent, even though she didn't want it, they thought because she didn't verbally say no, it was fine. If she hadn't liked it, she'd have said stop, right? They think they had consent because she was flirting with them, 
earlier in the night. In this heartbreaking scene, Ruby um, turns to her friend Stacy and she thinks it's all her fault. I turned over and I must have passed out. And then I woke up and I was confused. I didn't know where I was for a minute. And I felt this hand. It was dark, I thought it was Ross, and I rolled over and his face was lit up. It was Matt. And he had this look in his eyes that blokes get, and I, and I couldn't move. <laughs> I didn't do anything, I just laid there. I shouldn't have gone back there. I shouldn't. I should have drunk so much. I shouldn't have done it. No, no, Rubes. They shouldn't have. He raped you, and the others just let it happen. I didn't say no. You didn't say yes. Ruby is encouraged to press charges, and she does. The two men are charged, but there's still a hell of a lot of drama around the situation. Martin is kind of taking the their side rather than Ruby's. A lot of people don't believe her. She is like confused and concerned and thinks no one's gonna believe her. She feels horrible. Martin's full of lines like, they're not like that. They're good blokes. They're my friends. They made a mistake. All this sort of stuff. Um, and while they claim that, you know, she was asking for it, she was a slut, she was a slag, she was leading them on. Um, of course she wanted them because look how much she was flirting in the club and so on. That's basically their defense for what they did to her. And then we get to the big kind of consent episode in the local pub and everyone um, is debating the issue essentially. essentially. There's a article in the local newspaper saying two men have been charged with the rape of a girl from the local, who they met in the local club. They're all discussing this issue, all sharing their thoughts, all saying this, 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 not realizing that Ruby is there, the victim in the pub, but also the two rapists are there in the pub with Martin. So like I say, I thought it was a really well done, well made, thought provoking episode. Um, I want to touch on some of the discussion points that they brought up and talk about them in a little more detail. I'm going to show a few clips from the episode and then like discuss the ideas around them in, in more detail. Uh, what I will say before we start this though is that one thing I find really interesting is I follow the actress Louisa Lutton on Instagram and she's been very good for deleting the crappy comments but I've seen a few slip through. I've seen a few as they were posted. And the amount of comments, mostly from men, that say things like, sorry love, but your character on EastEnders is a slag, she deserves everything she gets. The amount of those comments is disgusting. And you know, seeing those comments be posted to this actress makes me realize how important it is for soaps like EastEnders and other TV and just mainstream media to bring up these issues of consent and talk about it and make people understand where these lines are and how, no, just because she was flirting in a club, it doesn't mean she was asking for it. And before we kind of get into the actual episode itself, I want you guys to think about something as some of these issues are being raised. Let's imagine the following conversations aren't just about rape and consent. Let's imagine we're not just talking about sex. Let's imagine we're talking about any anything else to do with people or the body or whatever, right? Imagine you order a meal at a restaurant are you obliged to eat that meal once it arrives in front of you at the table? Or is it perfectly acceptable for you to sit there and think, I know I asked for this, I know I've waited for this, but I don't want to put this in my body right now. Or imagine you spent the last few hours queuing for a roller coaster. You get to the front of the queue, you sit in the seat, you're about to pull the strap down when all of a sudden you think, I can't do this, I don't want to put my body through this, I want to get off. Is that okay? Or are you obligated to pull down that strap, sit in that roller coaster, and ride the whole thing till it's over? Imagine you're at the beach and you put on a swimming costume and you go all the way down to the water's edge and you dip your toes in a little bit, but then you think, mm, I don't really want to put my whole body through this. I'm not going to do this today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave. I'm going to go back now. Just because you're at the water's edge, just because you're in a bikini, are you obligated to go swimming in the sea? Or do you have that choice to walk away? Imagine you're drinking with some friends and you're all a bit tipsy and you start to kind of like get a little bit too drunk and you, you pass out on the sofa. All your friends are there and they say, you know what, let's do heroin. Because you were drinking with your friends, because maybe you're in their home, 
because they're all doing heroin, but because you're so drunk you passed out, are your friends within their rights to shoot you up with heroin while you're asleep? Or is that wrong? Should they not do that? People might say that consenting to sex is a different or more complicated um, issue than those examples I just gave, but I don't think the differences are all that extreme. They're all about you choosing what happens to your body or what goes inside your body or what your body goes through. And it's just the same with sex. Even though there are two people involved, both people need to be okay with it, to go through with it. And if you're not comfortable with it, you have every right to move back and say, no, I don't want this and not put your body through that. You have that choice as an individual. Every person deserves the right to control what happens to their own body. And no person should ever have a right to do something or act upon another person's body without their consent. So let's have a look at a few bits from the episode and then like start to discuss them and talk about them a little bit more, all right? So the opening scene of the episode is this great little like slow-mo shot moving around the pub. Um, I think it's all done in one take, it's really cool. Um, and there are quite a few like subtle little bits here that I think are really, really good and really interesting. Like, you know, the guy checking out Whitney and this and this. Um, and there's this great little juxtaposition, right, between Kush buying his girlfriend a drink and Ian forcing a drink on Mel, who he is like interested in and she's just like, nah, mate. As soon as Kush brings the drinks over for Denise, you know, she, she's like thankful, she reaches her arm out, she gives him a little kiss, that sort of thing. But when Ian comes over and like hands this drink to Mel, she's immediately like looking uncomfortable, she's pulling away, she's looking around to see if someone can kind of help come save her from the situation. And as soon as she sees her friend, she's like, right, you over here now, please. I think when I see Mel doing this, this is something that I've done in the past and I think most people I know have done in the past, both men and women, but mostly women. And um, you know, when someone is just kind of like too keen and too eager and won't take a hint or is just like unable to see that you're not interested in them and you don't want to just like outright say, leave me alone because that's going to come across as rude. So you have to like find these ways to try and make excuses to move away or stay away or call your friends over so you're not alone with them. You know, and I, I guess this tiny, tiny little clip here like raises the point um, or, or raises the question. When someone's like this lovable idiot like Ian, but he won't take a hint, is their pushiness just harmless and silly? Or is it just like the tip of a much bigger issue? Because that's a big issue and it's one that we are gonna kind of touch on a little bit more in a minute. But if someone isn't picking up on these hints that someone else isn't interested in them, and they, they keep pushing and pushing more and more. If the person who's pushing assumes it's consensual and can't see that it's not, can they really be held responsible for their actions? I think yes, but <laughs> it's one of these things that's like up for debate a little bit. A big like argument that's brought up in regards to this particular plot is that Ruby didn't say no, but she didn't say yes either. If Matt and Ross really couldn't tell that she didn't want to, is it really their fault that they're getting this awful punishment for it? Again, I'd still argue yes, um, but some people don't think so. And we're gonna get into that a little bit more in a minute. But the big thing I would say to take away from this is that if you're in any physical or romantic or sexual situation and you're not 100% sure that the other person is okay with it, just, just don't do it. It's that simple. There's no need to risk it. It's not worth it. And if you're unsure, ask first. Simple as that. It's, it's really as simple as that. Just a simple like, is this okay? Or are you okay? Is often enough. That's all there is to it. The episode begins with this like little story from Patrick, who is one of the most like loving, kind-hearted, wonderful characters on the program. He's been there a long, long time. He's beloved by everyone. And he tells this story of how when he was younger, he was interested in this woman and he kept asking her out and he kept asking her for this and this and this and she kept saying no to him. And it took him five attempts before she said yes. We all know, you know, I know, we've been waiting for this day. And I kiss her. Oh. And I got down on one knee. And she said no again. I'm only 50. And she said, Patrick, 
You know I can't marry you. But by God, you know how to grind a woman down. <laughs> <laughs> and I had her. This little story seems like a little throwaway line at the beginning, just like, oh, it's an old man telling one of his stories again. But it's brought back up later in the episode when Patrick says these lines. Forcing a woman to do something she doesn't want to do isn't complicated, man. It's evil. Mm. Here, look at her. If a woman doesn't want it... It oh, says yeah. the man who just said a woman said no to him five times. Right? Yes. yes. And I think it raises a really interesting discussion point, um, which I've sometimes heard be referred to as like a hard no versus a soft no. A hard no is supposedly when a woman is just straight out no, I'm not interested in you. Whereas a soft no is more like, I'm gonna say no for now, because I'm kind of teasing you, but keep it coming, keep trying. A lot of people turn around and say, well, how are we supposed to know the difference? And, you know, damn good point, right? I think it would be easy for me to sit here and say, oh, well, it's easy to know the difference. You just pick up on the social cues, right? You, you pick up on subtle differences in tone and language and body language and how they respond to you and how and when they say things, you know? It would be easy for me to say, just recognize that. But for some people, that's not so easy. Picking up on social cues doesn't come so naturally to everyone. It can be really difficult and it's not always super clear. That's why I think this issue is so complex. But again, I think a simple solution would be ask the person. I know, I know it sounds really silly and it sounds simple and it sounds stupid and I just keep saying it. But if you know you're not the most socially aware person or you're unsure if this person who's saying no is a hard or a soft no, if you don't know, ask. It's as simple as that. And if you don't want to be like super overt and super like in your face about it, a simple like, is this okay? Or are you okay with this? Is enough. It's not a mood killer. It's not embarrassing. It's not awkward. It's just respectful. I like to think most people would know this, but again, apparently some people don't, which is why if you're in a position where you or both of you are in a drunken state and you don't know how far you should take it, ask. It's as simple as that. Um, if you ask and the person says, yeah, go ahead. But if you ask and they say no, then you stop. If you ask and they're not in a position to say no, like they're unconscious or half asleep or whatever, you don't do it. It's as simple as that. People Maybe know the difference between drunken mistakes mm. and rape. Later in the episode, um, Rainey brings up a similar point with her husband Max when he says this. No, it's true, you can't say anything to women anymore. Max. <laughs> no, what happened to just chasing them, having a bit of fun? No one's got a problem with flirting. Everyone knows where the line is. People just play dumb and they get caught. Oh, right. One geezer's banner is another woman's lawsuit. You know when someone doesn't like what's going on. And Jack swoops in like a true gent and says... It's a grey area, isn't it? Yeah, well, if it's a grey area and you don't go near it, ain't yeah. that difficult? Is that right? Thank you. Um, and then we start to see people reading this newspaper article about how two guys have been charged with rape of a young woman. Side note, the club that they met in is owned by this couple and this woman manages it for them. So they're kind of a little bit invested in this as well, but they don't really know who the victims are. So like I say, Everyone in the pub basically chimes in on this conversation without actually knowing that the two guys who raped this woman are there on one side of the pub and Ruby, the victim, is on the other side of the pub. They don't know that these are the people, you know, the news article is talking about. Um, they don't know that this woman, Ruby, who is a victim, is someone who most of these people have known since she was like 18 or something and they've, they've seen her grow up and they know her. So without knowing that, without knowing that the the rapists are old friends, old school friends of, again, one of their close friends. Without knowing this, they start making judgments. Young girls, they drink too much. Look, it's a club. These things happen. Drunk girls, drunk lads. Short skirts. What would you expect? I've seen them going into your place. <laughs> and then Sharon swoops in like a legend and says... You're about a minute away from saying the girls are asking for it. And when you do, you'll be wearing this wine. Just and just to kind of like confirm this even further, later in the episode, Kush says... The girl was drunk. Don't have sex with people who are in a state to say yes or no. It's not that complicated. And that's 
the thing. So many people are just saying, um, and so many people share these views. And here's a very, very common thing. Sadly, amongst a lot of the people kind of in the town where I grew up, a lot of people I used to know um, or who were kind of friends with my parents and stuff like that, a lot of people shared these views. But alcohol is never an excuse for crappy behavior. Clothing is not consent. Drinking with someone is not consent. Um, spending time with them, flirting with them, again, having a drink with them, letting them buy you something, you buying something for them, it doesn't give anyone a right over your body. But these uh, these like comments and these views do raise a few questions, right? Stats show that alcohol is a factor in a huge percent of rape cases and sexual violence in general, especially when the perpetrator is or was previously a stranger to the victim. So what exactly does this mean? Does this mean that drunk people find it harder to pick up on signals about whether or not a partner is interested in them? Does this mean that drunk people find it harder to say no to someone else or find themselves feeling more vulnerable and unable to say no or more vulnerable and like more likely to be in dangerous situations? Um, or does it mean that people are more likely to lower their inhibitions and then do something that they later regret and make false rape allegations? I don't think it's the last one, but I think there are a few cases where that has happened, sadly. Like I say, I don't, I don't have the answers to these questions, but they're definitely something to think about and consider. Basically, does alcohol make more rapists or more victims or... Yeah, I, <laughs> it, it's, it's difficult. What I will say for definite is, and again, I can't believe I have to keep repeating this, but I'm going to. Just because someone is drunk does not mean they give consent. If a person is in an altered state because of drugs or alcohol, if they aren't fully aware of their surroundings, if they're not able to think clearly for themselves and understand the consequence consequences of their actions, um, if they've passed out, if they're unconscious, if they're any of those things, they can't give consent. It doesn't matter if they were flirting earlier in the night, it doesn't matter if six hours ago they said they were okay with it, in that state they can't give consent. And if you violate their body while they're in that state, that is rape. Consent needs to be given at every stage, not just earlier in the night. So Stacy goes up to the two rapists who are drinking with her husband and she confronts them. She calls them rapists loudly in front of the whole pub and they get really defensive. Maybe, maybe we Is anyone talking to you? Stacy. Oh, sorry, am I being rude to the rapists? You should be careful what you call people. Don't just throwing words like that around. And again, I find this point so interesting. There's a lot of well-deserved, might I add, um, stigma about being called a rapist. I mean, no one wants to be thought of as a rapist, do they? Even criminals in prison get a lot of stick for being rapists. Like, no one likes a rapist. Simple. You know, and, and we see this stigma in the episode once Stacy has announced to the world that these two men are rapists. No one will serve them, they're kicked out of the pub, everyone's looking at them all disgusted and judgy. So if people hate rapists so much, and they're so ashamed of people thinking they might be a rapist, why not take precautions to make sure you never actually become a rapist? And by take precautions, I mean don't rape anyone. This sounds silly, but if you're so afraid to be called a rapist, and you see yourself approaching this grey area, and you're not quite sure if you have consent or not, get consent before you go any further. These guys in the episode, they know being a rapist is wrong, and yet they do mental gymnastics to justify the actual act of rape that they did. They don't see themselves as the bad guys. They, they feel worse about being called rapists than they do about the actual raping of this girl. Ross, like I say, one of the rapists, he goes on to show this later when he says to Martin, This could be you. You realise that, don't you? This could be any man in this pub. What, you, you never slept with a drunk girl, Martin? You never bought a girl a double instead of a single, hmm? You never told them you were a flipping, I don't know, a rocket scientist or something, just to impress them. All right, boss, OK. Maybe all that was wrong. It was a mistake. You're not facing prison for that mistake, are you? He genuinely believes they did nothing wrong. He thinks it's just a case of a woman regretting sleeping with them and crying rape. That is what he genuinely believes. He's not, you know, an evil guy. He's not trying to manipulate the situation. He just genuinely believes he did nothing wrong, which is probably the most terrifying thing. 
And he even concedes that, you know, if he did make a mistake with Ruby, then he doesn't think he should be facing prison for it. And right here is why I think we need big conversations about consent and where these lines are and what giving consent and getting consent actually is. We need to talk about where the boundaries are and where people feel comfortable and where these grey areas are and what to do if you find yourself in a grey area. We need to encourage people to be very open and honest with their partners um, when it comes to sex and actually talk to them and communicate. Even if it is a one night stand, even if it is a little thing, fling, talk to your partner, communicate with them. If Matt's character had at any point just taken a moment to slow down and stop and look at Ruby and say, is this okay? He would know that she wasn't okay with it. He would know that she was probably for most of it too unconscious to know what was happening. She'd have had a chance to say no. In every situation, a simple question of, is this okay? Gives both people a chance to say no or yes. There'd be no confusion, there'd be no rape. Just because a person isn't crying or kicking or screaming for you to get off them, it doesn't mean they're saying yes. It doesn't mean they're consenting. And the more people who realize that, the better. Could be any one of you. You realize that, don't you? Yeah, she drinks the drinks that you give her. She kisses you. She comes back to your house. And she takes her clothes off. She wakes up in the morning with a hangover and goes to the police. Say it again. Um, buying someone something, having something bought for you, um, dressing a certain way, drinking a certain thing, it's not equal to consent. It does, however, raise uh, little questions about people who make false rape allegations, because we have to be honest, there are people who do that. It's another conversation we need to have, and we need to make sure that adults don't feel shame about having consensual sex. We need to take that stigma and shame away from that and make people feel, you know, comfortable and happy and confident in enjoying their own bodies. And we need to make sure that adults are taking responsibility for their own actions. And that means if you did consent to sex at the time and later regret it, you have to take responsibility for that. You can't hide behind false rape allegations. Yes, regretting something is horrible, but it doesn't make it rape. They've been arrested. But mum, girls just don't make this stuff up. Well, I'm sorry, darling, sometimes I do. Again, this is why both parties understanding consent and what it is and how to give it is so important. Victims, as well as potential perpetrators, need to understand the difference between rape and regret so that they can really process what's happened to them or happening to them. Regret, like I say, is horrible, but you need to work through it as part of being an adult. Rape, is never your fault. And that's not something anyone should ever have to go through. That's not or shouldn't be a normal part of life. Rape isn't your fault. Plus, as Linda says to Ruby later, You know in your heart if what happened was right or wrong. And if you were brave enough to tell someone and go to the police and do everything you had to do to get it here, no one has the right to question it. I mean, let's be honest for a second, there's always going to be like a minority of people out there who are bad people, who do bad things. There's always going to be some people who want to intentionally rape other people. There's always going to be some people who want to intentionally lie about being raped. But this isn't exactly like a conversation about them, because they're the kind of people who are probably going to do crappy stuff no matter what most people talk about. Does that make sense? This conversation is for the majority of people. It's for the people who don't want to hurt anyone else. They don't want to be rapists. They don't want to be raped. Um, and they would never lie about these things. Talking about consent and understanding what consent is and where these lines are helps everyone because it makes sure that the people who don't want to hurt people don't do it by accident. Uh, next up in the episode, Martin's ex-wife and his daughter, who's just turned 18, confront him about being friends with the rapists. Your friends raped someone. You saw the state of everyone that night. Just a misunderstanding. A are you being serious, Dad? That's gross. Th that is beyond gross. You're saying that rape is a misunderstanding. Did I say that? OK. So when I wore that short skirt on Halloween, I was asking for it. I I'd be to blame. But your friends are just misunderstood. <laughs> and I've got to say, good on Bex's character here for pointing out this double standard. I think it's really important. I guess the kind of question or the point here is, if a victim makes a mistake of accepting a drink from the wrong person, 
having one drink too many, uh, wearing, you know, the wrong kind of clothes or whatever. If a victim makes a mistake like that, do they really deserve to have their lives ruined by the emotional trauma of rape? And then compare that to what Martin's saying, where a rapist made the mistake of sexually assaulting someone by not getting co consent. And apparently that's not their fault, and so they don't deserve to have their lives ruined by going to prison and being punished for the crime they committed. It, do you know what I mean? It's, it's a double standard where, um, you know, if a woman makes a mistake, she deserves to be raped. But if a man makes the mistake, you know, oh, it was a mistake, he doesn't deserve to go to prison. Um, I'm saying woman and man here just because that's the case with the Ruby Matt Ross story. But let's be honest, the genders could be any way around in these situations. But it, again, my point comes back to all of this could be avoided by a simple, is this okay? And I don't know why this is so complicated for so many people. And then there's a bit where Kush, who is one of like, he's a great character, and he's a lovely guy, and he really means well, and he makes one of the most disgusting comments in the entire episode. I'm not saying it's right, but if you're gonna get that drunk, then sometimes there are consequences that you might have to take. Yeah, if you drink too much, there are consequences, like having a hangover or tripping over because you're clumsy. Being raped should not be a consequence of drinking a bit too much. Uh, later, Martin tells Ruby this. It is horrible for her to have to sit there and watch him justify himself to the whole pub. Maybe she should stand up and tell him all exactly what happened, see how they'd like well, maybe it. maybe she should, oh, Stace. You are nasty no, sometimes. I'm just saying, why, why shouldn't everyone notice you, Ruby? Yeah, everyone knows it's them now. Yeah, it's just that you're not having to put up with the consequences, and they are. The consequences for her is she was raped. Yeah, and the consequences for them is that Ross has lost his job in America, like Matt's life's falling apart, and they might go to prison, all because of a drunken oh, night. Which, again, I just find disgusting, because it's like, what, being raped has no consequences? I, I'm not going to pretend I, I have any idea what it's like. Thankfully, I don't. Um, but I know it's not just a simple of, whoops, this happened, better move on for it for most victims of rape or sexual assault. I guess for most people, being sexually, physically, emotionally violated is a lot worse uh, than people being mad at you for inflicting pain on someone else, you know? I would much rather people were mad at me for something I'd actually done than I was raped. Because one of those things you know, people are mad at you for the consequences of your own actions. Being raped, that's not your fault. You don't blame um, the victim of a theft for owning things, and you don't get mad at the victim for reporting the crime. So why do you get mad at a rape victim for reporting a rape? Because she's ruining the rapist's lives. They've already messed hers up. They've already violated her. Linda puts this into a little bit more context with this great line when she tells Ruby this. Ruin their life. Screw their lives. How dare they do that to another person? And then the conversation moves back to Stacy and Ruby. And Ruby's feeling all anxious because, you know, she's in this building full of people who are talking about her but not realising they're talking about her. And she doesn't want people to know that she was the one who was raped in case they judge her or mock her or treat her differently. Um, she's troubled by how many people are talking about it and what happened and passing judgments and, you know, just based on what's in the paper. And Stacey tells her this. Oh, now everyone's talking. I just don't know. Why. They don't know it was you. I don't want everyone knowing. They don't. But if you ain't done anything wrong, they'd all shut their mouths if they knew it was someone they knew and not some random girl. In a similar vein, later Max comes over and delivers this line. Nice friends, Martin. Oh, shut up, Max. But is there nothing you won't take advantage of? No, I'm just not a fan of rapists. You know, I've got two girls, haven't I? So. Which is then followed later on in the episode by Ruby delivering one of the best lines of the entire episode. Why does everyone do that? As if it's only bad if a man can be upset by it. What? Well, you just hear it all the time, don't you? She's someone's sister, daughter, mother. How about she's a person? And that's a horrible thing to happen to her. Everyone makes it out as if being a woman's not enough in our own right. You've got to somehow be connected to a man. Just like when a man only cares about a woman because he's had a daughter. And I, I have so much respect for EastEnders, including this line. I think it was a very, very important thing to put in. Just, yes. <laughs> Can we stop teaching people not to hurt people 
because you know oh think about what if it was your mother or friend or sister like we need to stop that and start teaching people don't hurt people because they're people i think bex again going back to her she also brings up a great point when she says this look just because you know someone doesn't mean that they can't do bad things throughout this entire story arc martin has been full of like comments like oh but they're good lads and i know them and you know they wouldn't do this they're they're, they're, they're good lads you know that kind of thing um but that that is the thing sometimes it's the nice guys isn't it sorry it's, it's fine no really honestly I, you know me i'm not a bad bloke oh martin that is what they all say i'm not a bad bloke not all blokes are like that you ain't stopping them though, are you? You're sitting there, you're egging them on, you're having a laugh with them, you're making them think it's all alright. You can tell me as many times as you like, you ain't a bad bloke, but you definitely ain't a good one. No, that's the point. It's not just evil guys, it is regular guys. Rapists aren't always these big, bad, boogeymen type characters who hide down dark alleys and go out of their way to try and hurt people or hunt people or stalk people. They're not these like creepy villains who, I don't know, like hide around corners and uh, live separate from society. Most people who commit rape are normal people. And that's the kind of terrifying thing. Anyone who just doesn't bother to get consent, anyone who doesn't communicate with their partner, anyone who doesn't stop to consider what their partner wants or ask them what they want, anyone like that could be a rapist. And then Ian, of course, like in typical Ian fashion, hits us with the whole... Well, not all men, Not, right? a, the... not all men! Y you're really saying... You do realise that you're actually saying that. It is literally a hashtag. What? Oh, I'm... I, I'm not even gonna comment on this, cos... You know, we all know he's missing the point entirely. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then Jack brings up the point that this doesn't just happen to like bad women or weak women or stupid women or whatever. Um, he tells his brother this. Look, I'm just saying, I never realized how many women I knew had a nasty story to tell, right? Like it was just normal. And I think it was brilliant that they included this bit. Jack recognizes this point and he sees it as a cue to change and for society to change and for us to learn from it. Phil, during this episode, also sees that point, but he sees it a little bit differently. Women are put up with it all this time, aren't they? Now they're all saying they're all traumatised, aren't they? In response to Phil's line here, Denise hits back with this little um, kind of comparison, this little retort that <laughs> is kind of typical of what you would normally see in one of my videos. It's like, you know, with the very dramatic comparisons. People have been putting up with slavery and workhouses, Phil. It don't make it right. It don't mean that it doesn't need to change. And onto this, she later adds, this. All these men, you get so offended because women are saying, please, can I be conscious before you try and sleep with me? Um, Sharon's character also raises a really interesting point, which um, I've heard spoken about quite a bit. And I often see it on like anti-feminist YouTube videos. They always bring up this point. But it's just sad that in the future, it's gonna be all these scared little boys having to ask written permission to kiss a girl on the cheek. I mean, so many people are like, Oh, enthusiastic consent? Phew, that's, it's just unrealistic and stupid. What do they want? A written contract? Oh, we won't be able to do anything anymore. A l <laughs> I don't know what that voice was. Um, no, a lot of a lot of people bring up points like this, and um, yeah, I think I I think it's a little bit naive to be honest. Um, no one's asking for it to be difficult. No one's asking for it to be over the top. No one's asking for a written contract. No one's asking for a written consent. No one's asking for a yes before you touch them and then touch them and then touch them. Like you don't need to say yes before every touch. You know what I mean? It just it just requires a little common sense, a little common decency, a little bit of respect and talking to your partner. That's that's the key, communication. Like I keep saying, the occasional, this okay, is usually enough to gauge whether someone likes something or not, whether they're okay with it, whether they're consenting or not. It's not difficult, it's not time consuming, it doesn't kill the mood. There's just no excuse really, is there? The conversation gets a little more complicated and they bring up a few points we've already spoken about, um, and show that there are no kind of real clear answers 
Um, here are a few like other little bits about where it gets complicated. Well, it's not all dark alleys, knives and violence, is it? Just sometimes you feel like you can't say no. Yes. So what I'm saying is that's horrible yeah. if you feel you can't yeah. say no, right? But that's that's not rape. That's not the man's fault. Silence isn't a yes. If a woman doesn't consent. Well, yeah, that's the word I was looking yeah. for, Janice, actually. Right. Yes. If a woman doesn't consent, then it is rape. It is that simple. Yeah, but it's not just, you know, shy girls and sweet girls, is it? It's all women. It's all women have had this. Been too scared to hurt a man's feelings rather than doing something they feel comfortable with. And I think this bit here is a really good bit to kind of start to finish on, if that makes sense. Um Although I'd extend it to, you know, all people, not just women, you guys know how important I think it is to be considerate of other people's feelings, right? I think it's just common decency. Um, but when it comes to your body and your life, you do need to put yourself first. You should never make yourself feel uncomfortable just because you don't want to offend someone else. If you don't want someone to touch you, if you don't want someone to be in your space, if you want someone to leave you alone, you should be able to say that. Um, and then there's this bit in the conversation. Sorry, but women like sex. That's that's a feminist thing. That we never is, said so we I didn't could... like it. Yeah, we just want to have a say in when to have it and not feel scared that we're insulting men or, or ending a relationship. I, I or... And I think, again, that's the thing to remember. When it comes to something like sex, there are two people involved, and you can't forget that. You know, not, not just two people, two individuals. Two people with their own thoughts and feelings and beliefs and likes and dislikes and boundaries. Two individuals. You can't forget that. You can't assume the person you're with feels the same way as you do. You can't assume that the person you're with feels the same as the last person you're with. You can't assume that the person you're with feels the same way they did a few hours ago. You need to keep communicating with them. And remember that both of you are involved in this. I mean, not only is that going to clear up any grey areas and consent issues, but it'll just make it better for the pair of you, to be honest. Like I keep saying, the key is to communicate and keep communicating the whole time. Anyway, this video is getting very, very long. Before I just finish up, I want to show you this final little uh, little scene here with Ruby, where it was great. She, she kind of got a little bit of strength up. She decided to fight back. She decided to confront, um, I think his name's Glenn, who's friends with Ross and Matt, and he was there last night. Um, Louisa Lytton, uh, the actress, she delivered, I thought, a great performance, not only in this episode, but just throughout the whole story arc. She's been doing really, really well. And I just wanted to kind of thank and congratulate her and EastEnders for talking about such an important topic and doing it in such a good way. Um, and I want to leave you with these final few little bits from Ruby. Everyone all night talking abstract like there aren't real people involved. As if this stuff doesn't actually happen. It's all theory and funny and about being politically correct. They should be embarrassed, they say. They're the ones who did this to me. Prof, if you had seen her that night... I mean, I don't like to say this, Mark, but the girls are slack. Come on. Naming me is the worst thing they can do. They've done the worst thing. The worst has happened already. <laughs> well, well, look, I've done nothing wrong, yeah? You ain't done nothing wrong. No-one has. It's that some blokes have slept with a liar. Call me a liar again. Just because you're a girl, we got to believe you. Cry a victim and everyone feels sorry for you. Well, I'll tell you who the real victims are. I woke up to a different man. Not the one I went to bed with and he was touching me. Sorry. When did I say yes to that? Screaming, crying, begging him for him to stop, was you? No! But it's not on me to stop them, it's on them not to do it in the first place. That don't make them rapists. Well, yes, it does. It's a brave new world, so get used to it. Again, apologies, this was such a long video. I'm not exactly good with, like, short and subtle, but this video, I think, there are a lot of things I wanted to talk about. There are a lot of angles I wanted to discuss. It could have been twice as long again. I think this is a really, really important one to talk about. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. What you think of the conversation points brought up in that episode of EastEnders? What do you think about the issues of consent? And do you think some places have taken it too far? Do you think it's not going far enough? Um, how do you feel about like the gray areas? What about the whole hard and soft no issue? Um, that's, again, a little bit of a complicated one. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. And also, if you watch EastEnders, let me know what you think of this storyline. Let me know what you think of Ruby's accusations um, and how it's all being handled and so on. Um, but I'm going to stop talking for now. Thank you so much for watching today. I appreciate you guys so, so much. You're amazing. And I'll see you guys again soon. Thank you so much to everyone who watched today and to everyone who is supporting me on Patreon this month, including Gambit and Shofa, Deshawn, Christian Berg, Rachel B. Royer, Jaden Shepard, Corthy, Jaylee Moore, Sir Michael Moore, Christian Opitz, 
Sage Villarreal, Greg Ladd, Spencer Young and Lauren Hart. And to everyone else who's mentioned on this end screen and down in the description below, thank you so so much. And to everyone who watches my channel, have a Merry Christmas and a Happy Holidays and just a wonderful little December. And thank you all so much.